Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come, whatever we can come up with. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and the sadly out of print Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and a writer about music for various publications uh, these days, mostly the Wall Street Journal and um, I suppose the Portland Press Herald. I do a lot of stuff for them too these days because I live in Portland. I'm joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and as one of the four hosts of the podcast, video podcast, Talk More Talk, which is just solo Beatles. Hi, Ken. How's it going? Good. How are you, Alan? Hi to all of our listeners. Okay. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area, now in his 37th year doing that. Uh, If you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. How's it going, Darren? Everything's great. Hello, everyone. How are you? Okay. So today we are going to talk about a subject that is not in the least dear to my heart, <laughs> um, uh. but but which I nevertheless find actually pretty interesting historically when I sort of look over the whole bunch of it. And that is the sort of surprisingly large discography of Beatles um, hits compilations. And we're we're talking about just Beatles as a group, and um, we're going to we have we have actually a lot of ideas about them, and um, you know whether in these days of streaming and everything else, it's there's there's even a point to them anymore, whether there ever was a point to them, which I often say there isn't, but I secretly know there is. So, but before we get to that, uh, we've got some news which Ken will give you now. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Anytime. Um, the uh, news is a bit thin this time, but uh, I will get to it and uh, very eagerly discuss our topic. I first of all must apologize because I know this first item here, I've known about it for a few weeks, but I forgot to mention on our last show. And thank oh. you to, Ro- to Rob Nataro, who sent me this as a news item. We'll start with uh, news about a tribute single that was released recently. For Tom Petty, the song is called For Real, and it has Danny Harrison on it, as well as Jacob Dylan and Willie Nelson with his two sons, Lucas and Micah, and Amos Lee is also on the recording. Um, it's available digitally, and it's been released on Dark Horse Records. The song itself is a Tom Petty song, which he recorded in the year 2000, and it was released in March last year on a 38-song compilation spanning Tom's entire career called The Best of Everything. Really is an excellent song, and uh, you can catch a video on YouTube for it. And there's even a a short video, about two minutes long, on the making of the recording of the song. Basically, all the the musicians saying how uh, honored they are to be taking part in something like this for Tom. Really good song called For Real, so check that out. And Danny Harrison will also be taking part as one of several artists commemorating the life of legendary sitar virtuoso Ravi Shankar. And uh, this year marks 100 years since Ravi's birth in April of 1920. The centennial concerts will feature members of Ravi's family, like Anushka Shankar and Nora Jones, Along with Philip Glass and an orchestra of Ravi's disciples, Danny Harrison will be performing at two shows at uh, the San Diego Civic Center. That's on May the 16th, and that's for a benefit for the for the uh, Shankar Foundation, and also at the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles on May the 19th. That should be interesting. I'm wondering what Danny will do, since I don't know that he plays the sitar at all. You never know, but he could just be playing guitar to accompany uh, someone on the sitar. 
he could be playing tambura too, the, the sort of drone instrument that you know sort of provides a backdrop as a sitar player plays. You know, it's not it's not the most exciting thing, but it's it's actually an important part of Indian music. So it's possible. Yeah. I mean, he could he could do all kinds of stuff. Listen, there's also all that um, Shankar family and friends stuff that um, George produced on Dark Horse, um, and those are pretty conventional Western songs, more or less. He could do something from there, too. Okay. Good points right there, Alan. Also, uh, the new issue of Guitar Player is out with George Harrison on the front cover. This is partly due to this year marking the 50th anniversary of his classic album, All Things Must Pass. According to the front cover, the issue discusses how the Quiet Beetle became a guitar legend. Also, this issue concerns his iconic guitars and his classic songs. Now, something I know that both of you found out about in the last few weeks, you got a lot of news. The Beatles' Abbey Road album was the best-selling vinyl album of the past decade. Mm-hmm. It sold 558,000 units. Sgt. Pepper ranked at number seven with 313,000 units. I know every time I, I've looked on the Billboard charts when they had a, a vinyl chart, um, Abbey Road was always on there. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not exactly a surprise. But uh, I do believe, and you should be happy about this, Darren, uh, Dark Side of the Moon was the number two All uh, right. best-selling vinyl album of the decade. Your two favorite now, bands right there. You said... Now, you said the Abbey Road sold 558,000 units? Yes. That was over 10 years? Yeah, I guess that's considered... That speaks, that speaks volumes. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ten, 10 years it took that long to sell a little over a half million units. You know, in the, in the good old days when we used to walk to school 10 miles in the snow. <laughs> uh, you know, and we lived in a cardboard sales, box. <laughs> those, those sales were possible in a week for certain artists. Yeah, that's you know true. What I mean? so, anyway, but that's very cool to hear that, that the classics are the ones rising to the top. Yeah, and you know, as they say, vinyl has been picking up in sales and I've even heard reports that they outsell CDs now Mm -hmm. that uh, 10 years from now, we'll look back at this decade and if Abbey Road is number one, I'm sure it will have sold more than 558,000 units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. And just for the record, Alan, I've always dreamed of living in a cardboard box. (laughs) I have. And I've (laughs) cracked up the (laughs) bed. Hmm. (laughs) In other news, Paul McCartney, his wife Nancy, and Kathy Hochul, who is the lieutenant governor of New York, were together at an Every Town for Gun Safety event in New York City on January the 9th. Every Town for Gun Safety is a movement of Americans working together to end violence, gun violence, and build safer communities. All right. Also in the news, the Georgian mansion in Weybridge where both John Lennon and Ringo Starr lived in the 60s, is now up for sale. The luxury property boasts seven bedrooms, a swimming pool, a gallery landing, and Victorian greenhouse. The property was heavily inspired by the Georgian period and features several castle-style turrets throughout. The Heartlands estate has unrivaled views of the surrounding leafy countryside and the exclusive St. George's Hill Golf Club. You can own it for 11 million pounds. Oh, that's nice. Growing up in the Bronx, I often enjoyed the leafy countryside. That was a (laughs) view that was outside my apartment. But uh, I may uh, actually look into that because I bring home another load of music like I did recently. I'll be looking for somewhere to live because my wife will have booted me and everything I bought out the door. We need more space, all of us. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, more news jazz guitar legend Al Dimiola will be putting out his second CD of all Beatles covers it's called Across the Universe and it follows Al's 2013 release called All Your Life a tribute to the Beatles on the new album Al reenacts the front cover for John's rock and roll album playing the guitar in front of the building in Hamburg where John's photo was taken Al is quoted as saying, he says, I really credit the Beatles for the reason why I play guitar. Uh, 
that was a major catalyst for me to want to learn music. So their impact was pretty strong. That's great to hear. I love Al DiMaiolo, if I may jump in here. Mm -hmm. Big Al Jazz album that I ever bought was Electric Rendezvous. And I love his uh, the first of Beatles tribute record. So I did not know about the fact that he's got a new one, another one coming out. Yep. So that went right on my list here of things to get. Okay. That is coming out March the 13th, and it's on Ear Music. Mm -hmm. Some new books coming out, all on John. One is called In Lennon's Garden, an intimate portrait of John's final years. That'll be released May the 28th by Michael Tree Medeiros. His nickname is Tree. <laughs> John and Yoko's former gardener. That's who he is. They hired him in 1977. He shares his honest and insightful recollections of the times he spent with John during the last years of his life. Michael observed John's parenting skills firsthand, and he was with John when he sailed to Bermuda. It's described as a heartfelt tribute to John that also ponders the artist's evolution and insecurities. That sounds like a great read. Hmm. But, you know, that we don't know that much about. And I'm assuming that we're talking when John was, um, when they had a home in Nassau County. Cold Spring Harbor, was it? Right. Yes. It oh. might, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just, so that sounds very interesting, that book. Okay. And believe it or not, Ken Womack has another book coming out. We mentioned one in our last show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The Beatles in Context, which is coming out in March, but he has one coming out on John Lennon called John Lennon 1980, The Final Days, and that'll be released on October the 8th, 2020, one day before John's birthday. You got to imagine, no pun intended, that this being the uh, year when John would have turned 80 and the 40th anniversary of his passing, there'll be a lot of books coming out on John. Another one that I just found out about, which is coming out in November, is called Hold On World, John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Plastic Ono Band, 50 Years On. That's by John Cruth, and that'll be November the 15th for that book. Mm. So something for the uh, 50th anniversary of the Plastic Ono Band album. And finally, some happy birthday wishes. 75th birthday going out to Eric Stewart, who on January 20th turned 75. Great work he did with Paul McCartney on the Press to Play album. Of course, his many years in 10CC and also in being in the Mindbenders. And Rusty Anderson, Paul's guitarist in his band, has been with him now for a long time. January 20th turned 61. Hmm. And that's it for the news. Okay, and I think we also have a holdover from last time clarification from Darren. Yes, uh, we were talking uh, about the Neil Innes album. And Neil uh, had uh, was making the album available for one of these. Um, what, what would you call these? Uh, A these crowdfunding. Um, right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Neil was Neil was uh, using one of these crowdfunding groups to uh, help fund and get his album, which unfortunately turned out to be uh, turns out to be his final album. Uh, nearly really out there and i had mentioned that it was uh kickstarter and i was wrong uh, it was pledge music pledge music was the group uh, that uh, went basically belly up and uh, took a lot of folks money including mine i had ordered something um through pledge music not related to the beatles and i got burned i didn't get i did not get my uh, my box set and uh, there were a lot of folks also burned by Pledge Music when they went to uh, fund and purchase the Neil Innes album. So, but last show I had mentioned Kickstarter, and I want to thank the uh, listener who wrote in and said, Darren, you dope. It was Pledge <laughs> Music, not Kickstarter. So just, uh, I stand corrected on that. Actually, I'm sitting now. So I sit corrected. Uh, it was Pledge Music. A and big... That's pledge <laughs> and uh, alfred daniel is the listener who wrote in to tell us that so thank you alfred thank you okay so compilation albums is that what we're calling them compilations yeah why not yeah so we're talking mostly about the ones that came out since the beatles broke up but 
There are a couple that I think we should at least note um, because, you know, in, and also we're talking mostly about the British and American ones, but there are a few from around the world that are worth noting too. The very first, of course, was the British a collection of Beatles oldies. And this was, I think, important for British listeners because Parlophone was not putting the singles on the albums like Capital was. So this compiled a lot of singles that were not otherwise available, plus uh, Bad Boy, which the Beatles had recorded and ended up on Beatles 6. I, I think uh, Capital wanted something extra for Beatles 6. Um, and they were in the middle of the Beatles for Sale sessions, and they sent that along, but didn't put it out on anything in England until this 1966 compilation. So that was something, you know, definitely worth getting if you were in England, because, you know, and, and if you wanted things on an album that weren't on an album before, you know, albums, for those of you who grew up way after the vinyl era, which is, I guess, coming back as we, uh, you know, albums were, you know, I, I don't know what your, your two experiences were, but, um, you know, growing up, I always bought the singles, but it was much handier to have things on an album, right? You know, you just put on the album, you've got, you know, the whole side playing, which was 15 or 20 minutes, and you didn't have to flip it over after four minutes. So, so there was that one. And then uh, you could argue that Magical Mystery Tour was a compilation, right? Because it had the EP on side one, and in, and it had other recent singles on side two. Mm -hmm. uh, Although that now is the official album. It has been for a long time. So. That's right. That's right. And it, it didn't come out in England until 76. Um, so Well, when I suggested uh, this topic for us, to do on a show uh after i had suggested it i thought you know that first of all the terms compilation and anthology and best of collection those are all sort of interchangeable at least in my book yeah and when i made the suggestion to talk about the compilations i'm thinking in terms of like you just mentioned alan the post breakup compilations with some additions like you just pointed out the british a collection of Beatles oldies. But then I got to thinking, you know, it's, it's such a vague term because you can make the argument and you'd be correct. Well, the early Beatles is a compilation. Magical Mystery Tours, you pointed out, is a compilation. And you could even say that the U.S. Capitol albums, many of them were compilations. You could argue they that. Were, yeah. They uh, were built. The early Beatles, I would, I would argue with, with you because the early Beatles is, is really – the Please Please Me album minus a few tracks. Okay. Yesterday Not and Today it. is a compilation. Definitely. A yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I mentioned the early Beatles simply because I'm just looking at right now that Wikipedia will list the early Beatles as a compilation on their discographies. Interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, all right. You can even throw out the early Beatles and talk about Yesterday and Today. A lot of those albums are compilations because they are compiled – uh, with tracks from a variety of sources. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, you know, it was, I, I thought it was important that for this conversation, uh, the compilation, the anthology, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, we're looking at the ones mainly post-Beatles with a few exceptions, like, like you were just, like I said, you were talking about a collection of Beatles oldies, which actually was, A, the first, if I'm not mistaken, British compilation album, and Many will look at that as being the first official EMI slash band compilation to come out. Sure. Uh, even though there were some in other countries, but they weren't really, you know, given the, you know, they didn't really have EMI behind them the way a collection of Beatles oldies did in uh, December 66. Well, they had, they had whatever the local offices of EMI were. They just didn't have British EMI. They just didn't have Parlophone right. as such. Yeah. There, okay. there right. in fact, right. is another one of those early – I'm pretty sure this came out while the Beatles were still a going concern. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I got it 
while they were still around. And I'm not sure why I got it because, um, well, in, in those days I wasn't, I, I wasn't necessarily of the mind that I had to own every single Beatles thing issued, but I saw it in an import store and it was a little different and I got it. And it was a German album called the Beatles greatest. And when I got home, I mean, I, I looked at it and I thought, okay, you know, I, I really kind of have all these songs. But what I didn't know when I got to All My Lovin' was that it was going to have the five hi-hat taps that were not edited out of that version of the album. And also there was a, a Dutch version of it that had that too. And so this is uh, one reason why, I mean, when I said that I'm not that fond of compilations because as as a completist who's getting everything all the time anyway, compilations to me are just sort of redundant. And yet there are so many compilations that have an odd mix on them somewhere. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of those as we go through. Um, but I guess the, the, the first semi post Beatles compilation in the sense that when it came out, they had already broken up. I just don't think any of us knew about it officially yet. And that would have been Hey Jude or The Beatles Again, right? And uh, that was, you know, shortly after Abbey Road. And it was a little puzzling to those of us who had been waiting for what became the Let It Be album all year. You know, we we knew that the Let It Be album was being recorded because they had made they had done a lot of publicity about how they were going to do this TV show and film it and have a concert at the end and all that, and then it just sort of disappeared. And and Rolling Stone, it, it became sort of a joke in the letters column. Every few months, people would write in, "When is the Get Back album coming out?" Which it was known as at the time. And then Abbey Road came out of nowhere. And then even before Let It Be, we, we still have The Beatles again or Hey Jude. And uh, Darren, I think, has a, a special connection to Hey Jude, right? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> uh, I'm the young the three of us, and I was born in 1965. So at the time that The Beatles broke up, at least at the time that McCartney went public, with, uh, with his announcement that his solo album was coming and he was leaving the Beatles and the band was no more. I had just turned five uh, just a couple of weeks before that. And, you know, when we were, like I said before, when we were talking about future topics for the show uh, and I brought up compilations, I was um, thinking that the Hey Jude album is going to be coming up on its 50th anniversary. And ever since... Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. I know I have completely been uh, caught up in the whole anniversary thing. So uh, once Abbey Road comes out, uh, in terms of albums at least, uh, uh, I went to Hey Jude as our next 50th anniversary. Now, the Hey Jude album was a U.S. release, but was issued in other countries as well. It was When I say it was a U.S. release, it was a Capitol Records creation that then was also issued in Canada and Germany and Spain and Japan, France, and some other countries. And eventually by May 79 came out in the U S and excuse me, in the UK. Uh, and Hey Jude was the album that Alan mentioned was originally going to be called the Beatles again, a last minute change in title was made, but they had already pressed up the Apple labels saying the Beatles again. And they, Rather than, I guess, throw the labels out, they used them anyway. So, Hey Jude came out at the end of February 1970, so that would have been right before my fifth birthday. And sometime around its release or shortly after, I still can picture, I still remember vividly passing a local record store in the Bronx on East 187th Street in Little Italy section. There was a little record store and they had the Hey Jude album on display that you could see from the street. And the things that you remember from when you're an adult uh, that you did when you were little, uh, it amazes me. I can still picture going in the store with my parents and they bought me the Hey Jude album, which could very well have then been my first Beatle album because a little later in the year, I know my dad bought Let It Be and Abbey Road together 
bought them at the same time. But for me, Hey Jude would have beat that. And the album means a lot to me because it could very well have been the reason I'm the Beatle fan I am today. Hmm. Uh, my first batch of songs on an LP of Beatle tunes, it went a long way in introducing the Beatles music to me as a five-year-old in 1970. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 50th anniversary of that album, the first U.S. compilation album uh, to come out, uh, that anniversary is uh, about a month away, February 26th, 70. So I thought that that would be a good catalyst to look at the way the record companies repackage the Beatles music post breakup. Mm-hmm. And you also said, if I recall, in a previous show that you found the album a little bit baffling in a way because it stretched all these many years of the Beatles. Because right. you, and, but you I, go from yeah. Can't Find Me Love in 64 up to 69 there with the Ballad well, of John in, and Yoko. When I got the album, when I was five years old, I had no sense of time. I had no sense of, I had no knowledge really of anything regarding the Beatles together, apart, the breakup. If I had the album before the breakup, obviously I wouldn't have even known anything that they were breaking up. To me, these were 10 songs and they all belonged together in my little world at that time. And it was only years later that I realized Can't Buy Me Love and uh, I Should Have Known Better had been recorded so many years in advance of, say, Get Back. That meant that, that that time period meant nothing to me. When I was a little kid, they were 10 great Beatles songs that belong together because they're all on this The Beatles Again album that says, for some reason, Hey Jude on the spine. Right. Mm. You know, I think in a, in a way, Hey Jude, parentheses, The Beatles Again, was the American equivalent of a collection of oldies because all of these tracks were on singles or in the case of Can't Buy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better were on the United Artist version of A Hard Day's Night, but not on the Capitol uh, equivalent in a way, which was, was something new. Capitol ultimately, I think, gained control of United Artists um, and was able to put out, you know, the, the UA version of A Hard Day's Night as a Capitol album. But the other thing, you know, to me, it's funny that I guess maybe as a five-year-old, um, you know, it, it all was music and uh, you weren't thinking in terms of periods, but it is kind of a motley album in a way. I mean, it's uh, Can't Buy Me Love, Should Have Known Better, Paperback Writer, Rain, Lady Madonna, Revolution, uh, hey Jude, Old Brown Shoe, Don't Let Me Down, and Ballad of John and Yoko. It, it's almost in chronological order. I mean, Don't Let Me Down should go switch places with Old Brown Shoe. And so because it's chronological, you, you get development, you know, as you go from start to finish. But those first two are such outliers. I mean, the next thing, Paperback Writer, is 66. It's a totally different style. But what I remember being especially attractive about it was you know, I used to listen to NEWFM a lot in those days. Uh, and I remember, I think it was Jonathan Schwartz on his show once, either either Jonathan Schwartz or Pete Fornatel, saying, you know, in England, they have a stereo version of Hey Jude, and it's like the gospel of rock. And I thought, wow, I really wish I could hear the stereo version of Hey Jude. And you couldn't in the U.S. at least in, until this album came out. So that was kind of the big attraction there. I mean, I, I, I probably was a little let down by it because I didn't think it was that spectacular a stereo mix. But it was kind of cool, cool having it. Um, and of course, they left out the inner light. Right. And they left out I'm Down. You know, they, they, they didn't totally sweep up all of the B-sides and things. So that was a and little... And what, what doesn't make sense is that Can't Buy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better on here. A Hard Day's Night is not. I mean, I Should Have That's Known right. Better was the B-side of A Hard Day's Night in America. <laughs> right. And the B-side of Can't Buy Me Love was You Can't Do That. And that's not on here. Maybe they so, um, felt it would have taken a double album to add all of these miscellaneous sides that uh, that, that didn't get on. 
And that, yeah. I guess, brings us up to the next compilation. Well, before, before you, you talk <laughs> about the next one, just okay. want to let you know, when I look at this track listing for Hey Jude, with the exception of Can't Buy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better, it's kind of look, it's like looking at past masters. <laughs> you know, because it's, yeah. uh, you know, A-sides and B-sides of singles that were non-LP singles. Right. It was kind of the start of that, mm -hmm. in a way. So, yeah. Um, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated listening to you guys talk in this, the detail, and, and comparing it to, some will say I'm still five years old, but comparing it to 1970, to my listening experience, listening to it on my little show-and-tell phonograph, uh, of how it just seemed so cohesive to mm. my ears then. Yeah. That even today, when I hear Can't Buy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better, they don't jump out at me and go, early track, early track. Mm. They, I still hear them in the context of those later songs on the Hey Jude album. And, uh, you know, this goes back to the days when a compilation album could make an impact, which, we, you know, we would get, a, get to a little later in the show uh, how a compilation album, a greatest hits album, best of album, or whatever you want to call it, could have an impact on you, but that's not so much the case today. At least we don't think so. Anyway. Okay, so on to the next ones, which I guess are the two double albums, 6266 and 6770, better known as the Red Album and the Blue Album. Did I skip anything? Mm -hmm. I think No, are... no, not at all. Oh. Yeah, those were the first... Uh, those were really the first two true breakup uh, compilations, and I think it's safe to say they would be the two that were sort of released worldwide. It wasn't a case where they were U.S., U.K. releases or Jap Japanese releases. These were issued around the globe, and I guess they would be the first two to get you know that sort of distribution. Right. And, you know, I, I thought these two were really well done. I liked the idea of having an outtake from the Please Please Me cover on one, on the front of one, and an outtake from what was supposed to be the Get Back album cover on the other, um, showing mm. the early Beatles and the late Beatles. Um, and I believe the Beatles, uh, these were at least run by them, and and EMI asked for their comments and suggestions. Is that true? I think that's true. Uh, yeah, I heard, and I don't know where, I don't recall when, that George and John were the two that helped compile the Red and Blue albums. I don't know if they had, you know, the fact that Obla D, Obla Da made it onto the Blue album makes me wonder, did George and John really have any, you know, <laughs> how much say did they really have? But I have heard that they were the two that had at least uh, some fingerprints on those two albums. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's important to note that really these compilations came out because of the bootlegs that were released at the time. Right, Alpha and Omega in particular, mm. which I guess we today would call gray market, but it's a bootleg. The thing is, it's kind of ironic that a band that had more hits than anybody never had a greatest hits album. So there was an open market for that that definitely... There, there was a demand for that kind of thing. And it's really ironic that it didn't even happen until 1973. So I'm sure a lot of people were starving for that, where the Beatles were concerned. So it took a bootleg to come out that could have robbed the Beatles of, of making money. That was like, you know, mm -hmm. the impetus for getting this thing started. And the funny thing is, those two albums really aren't greatest hits albums. You know, well, I mean, there are album tracks that they're really, I mean, I mean, I know I'm splitting hairs here. It's probably more accurate to call them best of albums because there were tracks on there that weren't singles on those true. two albums. And, hmm. uh, you know, again, I don't I don't mean to keep harping back to when I was a kid, but these compilations, these 70s releases were my education. And I was eight by this time and I had the blue album. Uh, I think I got the Blue Album a year or two after it had been released, and I had the Red Album eventually on cassette. In absorbing those albums, songs like Magical Mystery Tour were, was a hit. That was a hit song to me. Until hmm. later, I really wait, that didn't even come out as a single. So the well, Red and Blue Albums were sort of somebody's 
idea of the best sampling of Beatles tracks not taking into consideration what was a single or what was a hit. Right. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, especially with the Blue Album, that once the, the singles were thinning out, there were less singles being released, how were you going to stretch two albums into that? Right. Other than putting A-sides and B-sides of singles on there, you had to fill it with album tracks. But even on the Red Album, you had something like Girl, which was uh, you know a little bit surprising in a way. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sure, and it's interesting, Beatles fans will have different opinions as to whether or not all their Beatles albums were represented fairly, because I know a lot of people think that Revolver certainly was not. Right. But, um, you know, the Blue Album is very significant because it kind of paved the way, at least I feel, for when rock radio was starting out. What Beatles songs were you going to play that weren't the singles? And I think it helped that certain songs, if you're going to pick a song from Sgt. Pepper, I mean, to me, I love all the songs from Sgt. Pepper. But would you say that the ones on the Blue Album, Sgt. Pepper with a little help from my friends, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and A Day in the Life, are the best ones? Are you overlooking other ones? But the fact that certain tracks were put on these compilations helped to get it more airplay on rock radio. They kind of used it as a barometer for what to play. As far as what were the best album tracks, songs that weren't hits. I do feel that way. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. I think Oh Blood Dio Blood Da got more airplay because it was on the Blue Album. My yeah. opinion here, hmm. you know. You know, there's another reason for these, apart from um, the inspiration of Alpha and Omega. The Beatles had, you know, during the time they were together, seemed to have always resisted hits compilations. I mean, they obviously couldn't control the ones that came out in Australia and Holland and, and Germany and, and various places that are, that are unique to those countries. But in England, they, you know, apart from Collection of Oldies, which came out really because there wasn't an album available for Christmas, you know, so they, they went with that. But otherwise, they had had not only resisted, but they also resisted having their songs on compilations, on multiple artist compilations. You, you know, you very you didn't really see that until "No One's Going to Change Our World." That could have been the first time a Beatles track appeared on a multiple artist compilation. You know, to mm -hmm. this day, it's very rare to find a Beatles recording on any compilation of different artists. That's right. Um, sometimes these days, well, not just these days, I mean, as of the late 70s, some of the Tony Sheridan tracks would start turning up on multiple artist compilations because EMI didn't control those. Mm. Um, but I think despite their resistance to compilations, when they were together, I think there was probably a certain amount of pressure from EMI to do something like the red and blue, because keep in mind in 1969, the Beatles signed a new contract with EMI that gave them a higher royalty. And uh, it, it, it actually, it actually was a very good contract for them. And EMI may have felt a little, um, badly done by in the sense that, you know, the Beatles signed the contract and then broke up. And while the solo albums were covered in that contract too, that's not what EMI really wanted. EMI really wanted group albums. And so um, I think that with the impetus of Alpha and Omega, EMI now had a leg to stand on when they went to the Beatles and said, okay, we have to combat this with something official and from the beatles point of view you know they were still going to get that big royalty so and they were no longer together so why not you know some of that is surmise and some of that is actual you know uh, what happened but um anyway i think that's another reason that we have the red and the blue because because there there obviously was not going to be any more group product forthcoming of course they could have started putting out unreleased stuff which would have been fine with me but mm. but they didn't I ask. also I also think it's very interesting how the singles that were chosen didn't necessarily have to be the British singles mm -hmm. because you have eight days a week right on this compilation you've got nowhere man 
So well, they didn't go strictly by the British releases here. Well, plus then you got album tracks, as, as Darren True. said. So, yeah. um, so I and guess... The, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Andy, uh, the uh, U, uh, U.S. Uh, Red Album initially had uh, the U.S. version of Help with the Bond intro. Right. And the U.K. Red Album didn't. It had the regular unbonded U.S. Uh, help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So after the success of the Red and Blue albums, which I think really were successful, I mean, you know, for me, yeah. even even though in, in those days I was in college and I, well, not yet a fanatical collector of absolutely everything, I, I was kind of getting there. And I got them on album and I got them on cassette because I did a lot of driving between Syracuse and New York, where I went to school in Syracuse lived in New York. Um, and those were good tapes to have, you know, right. Sort of belying my current attitude towards compilations. <laughs> um, I remember, I remember a very weird quirk with the, my copy of the red album that the, there wasn't enough tape on the pre-recorded cassette. Hmm. So, uh, I don't remember what the next to last song was, but midway through the next to last song on what would have been side one of the tape, the sound garbled and the tape ended and shut off. And then when you turned it over, it picked up with interference and halfway through help. Wow. I uh, I don't remember that. You sure you didn't have the eight track? I had it, but no, it was a cassette. It was a, it was a defective copy. And I also had a copy of the early Beatles where the pitch was off on half of the songs on one side. And I mailed them both back to Capitol because they used, they used to give you an address Mm-hmm. back in the day if you had any issues and the replacement copies that i got had, were the same exact defects to them huh. so I, there must have been a bad batch of those two tapes made in the mid 70s that or maybe somebody else uh, had them but uh you mentioned the red and blue albums being successful the blue album was a number one in the u.s mm-hmm. and uh, the red album uh, uh, reached three so they were enormously successful commercially speaking Right, but more more importantly, those albums stayed on the charts for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And usually, whenever there's a new release on the Beatles, and if we're talking about the '70s, if you're talking about the albums we'll discuss, like rock and roll music, um, and later mm-hmm. on into the '80s, until the Beatles one was released, those were the albums to go to for some kind of greatest hits, best of, and it was on the charts a long time. Mm-hmm. And, right. Uh, they were extremely important and very significant. And for a lot of people, it was their introduction to the group. So right. um, if you're going to start somebody out, if you're going to start a kid out on the Beatles, for some people, maybe this makes more sense than doing everything chronologically. Hmm. You know, why not know the hits with some album cuts? This is your introduction. This is your sampling. And then that leads to everything else, hopefully. But like I said, these albums were on the charts a long time. Just like the one album is now. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so the the next two, uh, I'm gonna we'll, we maybe should do them together because I mean, yeah. In in a way, they're similar, different as they are. Uh, one is the Beatles' Rock and Roll Music, and the other is Love Songs. And obviously, Rock and Roll Music, as they took a bunch of the rock heavier rock tracks and love songs, you know, is also self-explanatory. I once talked to someone who worked at Capitol, uh, well, a bit after this period, but I said, you know, what, what is it with, you know, you're just sort of like mining the catalog and putting together, you know, these semi-thematic things. And he said, listen, this is what happens. You go to a meeting, the guy presiding over the meeting says, okay, so who has an idea for a Beatles thing? And someone speaks up and says, yeah, I think we should do the ones with, you know, girls' names, you know, Lucy in the Sky, Michelle, you know, whatever. And they say, fine. Uh, they look at their watches and he says, okay, so meet me back here in an hour and a half with a cassette, <laughs> you know. And that was how some of these things came about. I mean, the guy might have been exaggerating. Well, probably was exaggerating, but you know, you can see you can see from these two albums that that was probably the way it worked. Well, if you're going to do uh, compilations that are thematically driven, mm-hmm. and you need a lot of songs to fill up an album 
or in this case, a double album for rock and roll music and love songs, it's got to be a theme where there are a lot of songs. Right. So rock and roll covers it, ballads covers it. And for single albums, nothing wrong with just doing their movie music. And you can put all their number ones on one album. Mm -hmm. So it may be a, a less of a list if you just do girls' names or boys' names. Right. So um, this made more sense. I think that um, for its time... They were brilliantly conceived. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of rock and roll music, I think what was also going on in, at Capitol was that they had pretty much single-handedly revived the Beach Boys' careers in 74 with the Endless Summer album, mm -hmm. uh, which double compilation. It was a huge number one. And I love the Beach Boys, and I don't mean any disrespect, but they were sort of stale as a, as a act when it came to... Uh, sales mm -hmm. and endless summer just put them right back smack on the map and made them a major concert attraction again reminded everyone how great the beach boys were they never gone away here are those old hits that you remember and mm -hmm. they followed endless summer a year later with spirit of america uh which was almost as successful and i'm thinking that by 76 capital was thinking all right what could we do similar to that with the beatles and rock and roll music was the first to come out, and then they you you know they divide they did the artwork uh, that was totally uh, inappropriate in that it was putting the Beatles in the fifties in a fifties setting, but it still seemed to be cut from the same cloth that those two Beach Boys albums were. Capital was trying to you know see what that they could milk out of the Beatles catalog like mm -hmm. they had done with the Beach. Boys. Yeah, and the Beatles were not that happy about at least rock and roll music. John, John, for one, I think hated the cover. And George Martin got involved with this because uh, I think while he was, uh, I think he was visiting Capitol on the West Coast and heard the album. And apparently this is the first time George Martin ever mentioned his problem with early Beatles stereo. And he gave an interview to Rolling Stone saying, you know, some idiot just put on the, you know, unmixed tracks for the early song. So I went in and I remixed it, you know, and he basically made them a little bit more mono by, you know, centering the vocals a little and the instruments. And so he made a new mix, which is what came out in the U.S., in England, they had the track list, and so they just assembled it from British masters, and it was the original mixes. So the British one was a little bit different initially. And I once had dinner with a guy who was, uh, was, was working at EMI. I, don't, I think he was a producer, I'm not sure. And he said, you know, I was responsible for saving the rock and roll album. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I had read that George Martin didn't like uh, the, the mixes that were on there originally and fixed the ones that came out in the U.S. So I persuaded EMI to put out the American version of the rock and roll album in England. And I said, no, that was a mistake. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> because, you know, the mixes are the mixes. And um, the rock and roll album, to me making it a little more mono, just made it a little more muddy. Did he end up leaving you with the dinner check? <laughs> I, I'm not sure who paid for dinner, but, but they... I, I remember <laughs> reading something along those lines, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, because rock and roll music came out in June of 76, and then four, year, four, four and a half years later, maybe to make more money, Capitol Records reissued them as two separate albums. That's right. Two separate yep. budget price single albums, and I think the mixes were different from the original double album in, in one of the countries. I'm mm. not sure if that's true or not. I wonder. Yeah, it could have been. It could have been that that was when he. Um, it could have been that they were originally different, and that's when the person I spoke to did the American uh, mixes in England. I, I, I'm. I don't remember the details. Yeah, I I'm, do. I'm probably I, mixing a few different things up. I do remember that when I, I met 
him and a, a colleague of his I, I, uh, named Simon Foster, who had started Virgin Classical and had also been an EMI producer. And when I sat down, they decided to give me a Beatles quiz. <laughs> one <laughs> question, one question, uh, which I know that you and most of our listeners can answer. And they said, okay, okay, so this is a little tricky, but John Lennon wrote a song and Paul McCartney wrote a song and they have the same title. What is it? And I said, you mean John Lennon wrote a song and Bernard Webb wrote a song? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, damn, we didn't think you'd know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about love songs? Um, what do we feel yes, about uh, that, guys? Uh, before we go into that, did, did the Beatles ever say what they thought about the concept of these thematically driven compilations i don't yeah. remember reading anything about that i just remember the negative mainly the packaging and right. uh, i remember hearing about that probably not terribly long after the albums came out and again again rock and roll music and these these compilations we're talking about were my education i never put two and two together with the 50s type or early 60s type artwork going with the Beatles who were a little later on in the 60s. Now I look and I'm going, come on, there wasn't somebody, uh, there wasn't somebody uh, paying closer attention in the, uh, you know, in the, in the meeting room, in the boardroom when they were discussing these albums to come up with better artwork. But uh, rock and roll music ended up being, you know, uh, you know, another of the huge selling record, but would end up really being the last one, I think, that had any legs in the market. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Beatles actually had a top 10 single out of that. Yeah. With Got to Get You Into My Life. And right. I always associate that album with the success of that single and Paul McCartney's success with Wings that same year with Wings at the Speed of Sound and his tour. Because they were simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And at one point, you actually had in the top 10, you had a Beatles single and a Wings single. Right. And I think there may have been one week when you had got to get you into my life silly love songs and let them in mm -hmm. in the top 10 hmm. that wow. was amazing <laughs> they did i didn't know this until earlier today and if i did know it i had forgot it they had a different single in the uk off uh, rock and roll music what back in the ussr was the single uh, in the uk right. with twist and shout on the flip side i don't know if it charted or not but you know as you pointed out can got to get you into my life was a top 10 hit 10 mm -hmm. years after it originally came out and health of skelter was on the flip side which i thought was always a kind of an interesting pairing yeah yeah that was some year 76 and in a way it is kind of um it, it just seemed really out of place that that cover for rock and roll music, the the, oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like going to the soda shop with the Beatles or, or yeah. the sock hop or something. Yeah, you know, that, it was, that was more it appropriate was like for American the, graffiti. You know, yeah, they mm -hmm. rolled American graffiti, the Beatles, uh, and uh, the concept of the Beach Boys anthologies all into one. Uh -huh. Yeah, and Greece, the movie Greece was that after that was after seventy six, right? That was seventy eight. Okay, so we Greece out of this, please, Darren. Uh, but by Love Songs, which uh, came out a little over, not quite a year and a half later, in October 77, the concept of the thematic or the, uh, you know, the idea of the thematic compilation album started running out of gas because Love Songs didn't quite catch on as well mm -hmm. as, uh, as rock and roll music did. Right. Right. Even though it came with the fake leatherette cover. Yeah. <laughs> it was a much nicer package. Yeah, uh, and, it was. Uh, yeah, and, and a variation of that whole ballad love song concept ended up resulting in uh, another album that you were talking about, Alan, before we started recording, uh, that came out a few years later in 1980 overseas, The Beatles Ballads. I don't know if the two albums really had anything to do with each other except for the theme, but, uh, you know, I always thought that there could be some sort of connection at other EMI labels in other countries uh, to kind of maybe fine tune that ballad love song concept of the love songs album. And make it a single album. Yeah, exactly. Right. A rather long single album, but yeah, just almost an hour long uh, for the Beatles ballads. I mean, ballads and 
love songs like rock and roll music makes a certain amount of sense because as, as Ken said before, if you're going to have a compilation, you might as well have a compilation of stuff where there's a lot of material to draw from. And, uh, you know, I guess if there's a value for me for those two sets, uh, rock and roll music and love songs and or ballads, uh, it's that, it's it's kind of like turning on the radio in a way instead of putting on an album because the tracks are not in the order that you think of them in if mostly you listen to the albums. You know, it's just a way of shaking it up a bit, I suppose, as a, you know, different way to listen to the songs. Mm-hmm. I don't think there are any unusual mixes on love songs and there's just Norwegian Wood on ballads. So should we move on to the next one? Yeah, I just want to say before we we continue, for me personally, as a young Beatle fan, it was exciting for anything new to come out, even though it's repackaged stuff, because it keeps the Beatles on the charts. It keeps the Beatles in the news. I was always rooting for them to go as high as possible on the album charts or in the case of got to get you into my life on the singles charts. And so it was exciting for me back Mm -hmm. then when I felt that, I had to have everything, right. even if it's music I, that I've had many times over. Right. So, you know, those were those were exciting times for me. I wouldn't feel that way now if the same thing came out today. Right. But as a teenager right. growing up, you oh, know, yeah. those were significant albums. Yeah. And and again, he'll repeat the same thing. They were my education growing up in the seventies, and all of these albums were Christmas gifts. I can remember getting them on Christmas morning. But hmm. Santa still came to my house. He may have given you guys uh, coal in your stocking, but he was still coming to my house <laughs> dropping off Beatle albums. And uh, rock and roll music was would have been Christmas 76, and love songs would have been Christmas 78 for me, 77 rather. Uh, and they were, you know, they, they're important albums to me, those two. I think that's where uh, my thought ended. Hmm. ends. But it's there really was, it, it, no. There was almost a single from Love Songs. There was one from Rock and Roll Music. There was almost one from Love Songs, but they pulled the plug on releasing Girl as a single, which <laughs> would have been uh, a track off of Love Songs. They, uh, I think, they gave it a catalog number, and I've seen picture sleeves. But Girl, with you, you're going to lose that Girl on the B side was canceled. Right. Yeah. Picture sleeves are around, uh, and probably counterfeit picture sleeves were around sort of like uh leave my kitten alone there's there are picture sleeves for that right yeah so i think around the time of sessions uh that was going to come out so the next one really is uh a european album i'm I'm not sure what country pressing i have here i think it might be british yeah and that is the beatles ballads do either of you have beatles ballads no, I, I used to see it in a record store as an import. You talking about the one that's got the drawing that they? Yeah, yeah. That? There was this this old drawing. There was this old painting called the Peaceable Kingdom. I, I can't remember right, who right. drew it, and this is in the style of that. You know, with the very sort of stylized round eyes and very colorful, and and the animals from the Peaceable Kingdom are are, are like in their laps and around them. According to I what just, I'm looking at. It came out in 1980. Right. Um, And, you know, this was basically, you know, like as the title says, you know, ballad. So it's Yesterday Norwegian Wood. I'm not sure. Do you want to know his secrets about you? Maybe for no one, Michelle, nowhere, man, you've got to hide your love away across the universe. All my loving, hey, Jude, something, fool on the hill till there was you. Long and winding road, here comes the sun, blackbird, and I love her. She's leaving home here, there, and everywhere, and let it be. So it's a pretty nicely packed album. Some things seem a little weird. I mean, do you want to know a secret? Sounds sort of like it doesn't belong in between Norwegian Wood and for no one. But hey, what can you do? The one major attraction here for people who collect weird mixes is that the version of Norwegian Wood... Uh, in stereo has the vocal centered where on rubber sole they were off to one side Um, so that was the thing that struck me immediately when i played it and uh 
you know, I guess what made it kind of a collectible album, because I don't believe that mix of rubber, of a uh, uh, Norwegian wood is any place else. Mm. Now you I guys should, have to oh. go get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> it does say here, the Beatles ballads was actually released. Well, not in the U S but in Mexico, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, Germany, Italy, India, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. So that's a pretty wide reach right there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so now sh- should we move into the 80s? I think, um, well, Why not? You know, Ballas really sort of was 1980, but. Yeah, so let's move into the 80s, of course. Um, on the heels of uh, Love Songs, we got the Rarities albums, which confused the heck out of me. Because Rarities initially was uh, an import in this country because it was an album compiled for a big box set of uh, Beatles albums in one package. I think it was called the Beatles Collection. So all of the Beatles albums in the box set and to catch up all the loose ends, sort of an early past masters, Rarities was compiled. Uh, It followed along with what would be considered Rarities in the U.K., And eventually, by, I think it was still in 79, it came out as an individual album. And I remember hearing about Rarities, running to the store, buying it, bringing it home, going, this ain't an American album. Yeah. Okay, I bought an import. I should try to find the U.S. version. And then, lo and behold, maybe a year later or so, uh, maybe less than that, actually, in 1980, the U.S., gets a Rarities album that was completely different. Right. Now, that brings us back to the, what we were talking about towards the beginning of the show. Would Rarities qualify in this discussion? Is it a compilation? Well, yeah, it is. They both are. They're both different albums with the same title and different artwork, and they're both compilations. But in the sense of repackaging previously released material, it's a bit of a gray area because the Rarities albums, yeah, had previously released material, but they may have been non-album tracks, so they may have been alternate versions as opposed to the ones that you already had on right. uh, early albums. Yeah, I mean, but the British rarity, one. It another, took the, me a while to figure out why there were two Rarities albums. Oh, one's American and one is British, and I didn't have an import of the Rarities album. It was never released here in the first place, and I was very confused, as I right. sound right now. But, yeah, but... You know, the British Rarities album, I mean, each of these Rarities albums was sort of specific to what hadn't been compiled on an album in each of the countries. So you have, you know, Come Gimmer, Dinah Hand, and Sie Liebdisch on the British one. Um, we had had those tracks on something new. The Inner Light, you know, was hoping that would be stereo, and it wasn't. Same with I'll Get You and, you know, so a, lot, a number of these things. I don't, you know, some of these things don't even really belong on the British one. I mean, Bad Boy's on here and it would, was already on Collection of Oldies, so it wasn't that rare. And But otherwise, you know, they have paperback, have Rain, not Paperback Writer, right? Just Rain. They've got some things from EPs, Long Tall Sally, I Call Your Name. It was kind of a, you know, I guess it... It doesn't count if what we're talking about is hits compilations, because some of them are hits and some of them are B-sides and some of them are, you know, weird things like the German stuff. But I guess it counts as a compilation in a way. Yes. Yeah. uh, The U.S. one had some things that were, in a way, newly created, you know, because uh, Penny Lane in stereo, but with the trumpet ending, you know, that never existed in reality. (laughs) And I think it also had, um, and I love her with an elongated ending that which is from a British uh, German album. Originally, isn't that on here? Yeah, yeah, the the American Rarities album actually played more like what we would I don't know, it was a precursor to the anthology albums almost. Yeah. It truly was rarities, yeah. as opposed to the one, which seemed to be more of a collection of non-album tracks. This really was, you know, uh, the U.S. rarities really was a fascinating listen because you heard all these little quirky things that you may or may not know, may or may not have known existed. Right. Uh, I don't know how Misery and There's a Place fell through the cracks 
on U.S. album until 1980. Right, because they sliced yeah. them off what would have been the early Beatles. Right. But you also have things, well, there's that And I Love Her, there's the mono Helter Skelter. I mean, the White Album did actually come out in mono in very small quantities in the U.S., I think, didn't it? Or no, it didn't. Magical Mystery Tour was the last one in mono in the U.S. So the mono Helter Skelter here, without I've Got Blisters on My Fingers, was kind of a, not only a rarity, but it kind of uh, let us know that there are things on the mono British White Album that we need to get our hands on. Um, Same thing with Don't Pass Me By. Yeah. And That's plus, great. plus the Rarities album first pressing became a collector's item in itself because this is how they describe the end of Helter Skelter. When the song fades out at the end, <laughs> it doesn't come yeah. back on the stereo version. So uh, like on the stereo version, so you don't hear the classic Lennon statement. I've got blisters on my fingers. I mean, <laughs> who worked for Capital in those days? I remember I mean, that. <laughs> I remember that. So I thought that was Ringo. Yeah, and, and they I, corrected I, I, it. The maybe second I should listen to everything. I clearly don't know what I'm listening to. <laughs> the second pressing came out, and they had corrected it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we got that. That was where the U.S. got the Sgt. Pepper in a groove. That's which right. Which would scare the living bejesus out of me when uh, that would end. In fact, I think I used to take my need, the needle off rarities before we hit the inner groove. Yeah. You know, it's I funny. The, the time, so, you know, I still used to get spooked. The inner groove, I don't think I had a pepper import in those days, but I'm pretty sure that Hunter Davies mentions it in uh, in his biography of the Beatles, and I had read about it elsewhere, and I always thought, well, what are you talking about? There's nothing going on in there. Oh, when it's... <laughs> you see, but I had heard it because I remember a radio show that would circulate periodically in the late 70s that was about Paul is dead and all of the clues, and the, and the inner groove was played during this radio show. Right. This radio special. So I knew it existed and had heard it, but now it was in my house on one of my records. And right. kind of in, in living full stereo there to spook the living crap out of me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still to I mean, this I, day, 54, it spooks me in a way. I knew about it by the time Rarities came out. But, you know, when, when, when the oh, Hunter oh, Davies okay. book came out was 68. You know, oh so God, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Alan. Okay, I yeah, you. yeah. By then, I had by then I had been bitten by the completest bug and had all the imports right. and, and and all that stuff. But um, so, but I thought it was kind of cool for them to include it on rarities because I felt they owed it to us, you know, not having put it on Pepper. I thought they should have just remade Pepper for the U.S. and which ultimately they did, and 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 put it on there. But it was a, a neat little thing. So I also we, think it was great to have that version of Across the Universe on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, that really was also only in import. That that so, was something at the time. I think you could only get on. Um, that you know, was going to change our world. Yeah, wasn't that on the UK rarities? Yeah, yep, it's on yeah. both. Oh yeah. So okay. either way, you couldn't get it domestically. You had to you had to get an import for it. Good by the time. And boom! Within one year, it was on two albums. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, have we done justice to rarities, do you think? I think rarities has so. uh, been talked about more than it ever has been. Yeah, okay. <laughs> which brings us to the next one, which also we'll, we may talk about more than it's ever been, which is real music. Uh, I think real music has taken a beating from a lot of people. But, it, you know, it's one of those things where you can see them having a meeting and saying, okay, what, what do you got for an idea? Oh, film songs. Meet me back here in an hour. <laughs> yeah. and, that was the first one I had no little little interest in and never bought it. Mm. You know, only in the last I'd say maybe ten years have I uh picked a you know vinyl copy up to fill in the hole in my collection. Yeah. I had the medley though for some reason, but not the album. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the medley was kind of interesting. You know, in, in those days, people were starting to do that, you know, stars on 45, that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, this yeah. was 1982, right? Yeah. 1982 yeah. was a, a big year for this stuff, actually. Um, there seemed to be a, a craze for that because the Beach Boys had a medley, too. 
that was right. a, a hit for them as a single. There was a Supremes one that came out, which I don't think did that well. Credence had one. And as you mentioned, Stars on 45, which was a, a number one hit mm-hmm. in the U.S. It, so I'm, uh, I'm yeah. reading this about real music. Uh, where it was uh, released almost sim- simultaneously with the theatrical re- reissue of the film A Hard Day's Night, which had been cleaned and re-edited with uh, Dolby Sound. So do you remember a, uh, a, a re- re-release of A Hard Day's Night in 82, Alan or Ken? I do. On video cassette. Yeah. Mm-hmm. According to this, yeah, the, uh, the real music album was sort of put out there uh, to kind of go along with that hmm you'd think they would have just put out some sort of a deluxe version of the hard day's night album but i guess in 1982 people weren't thinking about deluxe versions yet yeah they were saving that for the next century (laughs) right so uh you know i mean i'm just looking at the track list and it's you know four songs from hard day's night three from hell two from magical mystery tour two from yellow submarine three from let it be it's kind of at not even the complete film music you know by 1982 Mm -hmm. we all had video recorders and so i was at that point making compilations of say their film music you know I, i thought you know let's do this let's do this in the real way and so i would take all the songs from all the films and edit them together as kind of like a video album which i thought at the time they put this out, would have made much more sense for them to release. But did they ask me? No. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, real music was created and released to counter Alan Cozen's compilation for fear <laughs> that Alan's would have become a gray market release. Mm. <laughs> if you dig deep, if you dig deep, you'll find that every move that, that Capital made was to counter something that Alan was thinking <laughs> about at the time. They, all of these times you went to dinner with folks from Capital, they were planting wires on. I see. So next time I go to dinner with one of them, I'm going to let it slip that I'm about to put out the 27 minute Helter Skelter. <laughs> exactly. Good call. Good call. Carnival of Light. And Carnival of Light, yeah. And new deluxe edition of Life with the Lions should mention that. It's been a long time. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has anything else to add about real music. Because there really isn't much else to add about to real music. Mm-hmm. You know, but all the I next thing is, from my personal experience, as much as I loved seeing more Beatles albums come out, I think they were exhausting this whole idea. Mm-hmm. And I was yeah. getting really kind of tired of it at this point. I was glad to see the Beatles on the charts, anything to have the Beatles on the charts. But it's like, you know, you're running out of ideas now. Right. And that's how I was feeling around that time. That it said, gold, they did give gold, you a souvenir program, as they called it, with stuff about a little booklet with stuff about all the films and pictures from the films. And and the cover was, what do you think about the cover, guys? You've got the walrus. Uh, and <laughs> It was clever. Yeah. You got Hard Day's Night, Beatles, Help Beatles, standing side by side, sort of I think they stole that idea from Sgt. Pepper. Uh, <laughs> the real music cover, even though it did kind of have a little bit of a cheese factor thing happening there, was much better than the rock and roll music cover, album cover. Mm. Okay, so the same year, 1982, we have 20 greatest hits, certainly the least original title that they had come up with yet for a Beatles compilation, and different versions in the U.S. and U.K., well, I that's because certain songs yeah. made number one there that didn't make number one here, and that's why yeah. the Beatles one is so handy. Mm-hmm. And it was the pre twenty greatest hits. I remember seeing an edit of "Hey Jude," and I put it down and thought, yeah. "This board is on sacrilege." And little did I know what would end up being the precursor to the biggest selling album in the catalog. Yeah, um, the UK one. I should point out, however, has. Let's see. It has the whisper version of I Feel Fine, you know, where before the song starts, you hear the cymbal close and you hear them whispering. That's also on some of those. I think it's on the one volume of the two volumes of Australian Greatest Hits. Um, I think there's a Dutch album that has it too, possibly uh, 
The Beatles in Italy, which is an odd title for a Dutch album. It's not even, you know, you get the impression it's going to be the Beatles live in Italy or something, right? Because why? Why else? And it's just a hits compilation. But the UK one, apart from having the whisper version of I Feel Fine, has Hey Jude complete. So, Hmm. yeah. Good reason to get that I, one. I, I don't think I knew there was a UK version of 20 Greatest Hits, but it makes total sense. Yeah. And really, at that point, after 20 Greatest Hits, it stopped in the in terms of Beatles repackaging Beatles music. Uh, and it wouldn't be until, I guess... Uh, one. Yeah, once the 90s mm. rolled around and Apple was uh, rejuvenated and we got BBC and the whole new wave... That right. we're probably you could still say we're still in today. Now yeah. it it stopped because okay from uh, the seventies possibly seventy nine I can't remember when it all started, but Apple and EMI were legally at each other's throats for about a decade, and it was settled in nineteen eighty nine, and mm-hmm. the agreement was secret, but. A few clauses kind of leaked out here and there. And and one that I had heard was that Apple, even though EMI owned the tapes, part of the settlement was that EMI could not make compilations on its own anymore. No more love songs, no more rock and roll. They just sort of took that right out of EMI's hands and said that they also didn't want them ever reissued except for the red and blue. Um, And even then, it was a few years before those came out on CD. Uh, Right. Yeah, but it it was said at the time that those will probably come out and that will be it. Except it wasn't totally it, (laughs) because then there was one. So... But nothing can come out without the Beatles' approval. Right. That was the main thing. That was it. I mean, the Beatles could put together a compilation if they wanted to, or Apple. I mean, you know, at the time, Neil Aspinall, now it would be Jeff Jones. If the Beatles, you know, who basically are the four votes at Apple who count, uh, and they're, you know, widows, estates, whatever, they all have to approve it. And they approved one, obviously, because... You know, here it is. And uh, we've had in in past shows, I think Ken and I have debated the value of one. I saw it as mostly a waste of time. And Ken made the argument about new listeners and, and all of that. But, you know, I changed my mind when the new version of one came out in, what was it, 2015? Okay, with the videos. Yeah, yeah. The videos, to me, made all the difference. But also, I, I liked the new mixes. I, I thought those really sort of tightened up the the sound and and all of that. I mean, uh, my other issues with, with one were that, you know, why is Love Me Do on there but not Please Please Me? And so you get into which chart is being counted. And, you know, I thought Please Please Me was a better song, you know, and that it, it – it certainly has the legend, you know, you know, George Martin saying, gentlemen, you've just made your first number one. I mean, how could that not be on one? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. Right. And it's hard to explain to people because it's all based upon four different British music charts and the ones that made the Beatles one. And subsequently, if I check the Beatles 20 greatest hits in the UK, please, please me was not on there. Because on one of those four charts, it didn't make number one. Well, let's have a look. Um, Love me do for me to usually. Yeah, you're right. It's not on there. (laughs) Yeah. So at least they're consistent. Yeah. But, you know, you heard heard John talk about it in the Beatles Christmas messages going to number one with Please Please Me, thanking the fans for it. (laughs) But it's not on there. But I think that no matter what, you have to give props to the Beatles one because no matter what, every single time there's a Beatles album that's back on the charts, if there's uh, a new box set coming out for Sgt. Pepper, the White Album, Abbey Road, you'll always find the Beatles' later albums reappearing on the charts and the Beatles one. Right. The Beatles one is always on the charts. In fact, as we speak right now, it's the number 68 album in the country. And it says here, 
at billboard.com. 402 weeks on the charts. Mm -hmm. So really, like I said before, the Beatles won is pretty much what the Red and the Blue collections were from the 70s on up. It took the place of that. And I must tell you that nowadays, it used to be that I didn't like to intrude on young people who I notice are Beatle fans when they wear Beatle shirts, because I would like to know how they discover the Beatles. These days, I don't care. I just flat out ask them. But many times they've told me it started with the Beatles one. Their parents gave them the Beatles one. Hmm. So if that's what it took, I'm all for it. And I, um, apparently... Stop doing that, Ken, because next thing we know, we're going to the creepy old man, Ken Michaels, is in prison. <laughs> because he was questioning some young kids about their Beatles shirts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, aren't you curious how young people discover the Beatles? You know what? I'm, I'm not because so many get exposed to the Beatles because the Beatles are everywhere. I think I'm more inclined to... Uh, when it comes to other bands, I'm more inclined to think, oh, it's the fashion statement of the week. Everybody's going to be an ACDC fan this week. With the Beatles, I think I've seen enough like at Beatle Fests in all these years to know that there is something that will be time that is timeless about the Beatles, that it is almost like a natural passing of the torch. You know what I mean? I don't know. I also don't want to end up in jail and question uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of a lot of parents um, sort of foster an interest in the Beatles in their kids, and it somehow sticks, which is great. I mean, even if it's just you know starting off by playing the Yellow Submarine, which you know all kids love. You know, I I haven't found one yet who doesn't, and a lot of a lot of kids say that that was their start. But, yeah. you know, I mean, I always used to like I used to used to always say as a joke, you know, um, when someone tells me, you know, they had a kid or he's two years old or whatever, I'd say, well, can he identify all four Beatles yet? You know, I mean, that to me <laughs> is the, um, but once back in the old days when Tower Records existed, everyone remember that? I was in Tower and I was just, you know, looking through some stuff, you know, not, not Beatles stuff, but like, like on the other side of where the Beatles bin is. And at the Beatles bin was this guy holding you know, maybe a two or three year old. And he had picked up the record and said, okay, so this one is John, <laughs> this one is Paul. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's so great. <laughs> mm. Actual education in progress. Yeah, you'll find a lot of young people today are introduced to the Beatles from their parents. So um, they're a big factor right there. Yep. But, you know, I never take it for granted. This is music that's 50 plus years old. And right. it's miraculous that, that young people are discovering it. So compilations have been an important part of the Beatles history and in music history, and I believe still is. Mm -hmm. So, I was going to say, so as we reach the end of the show, folks, those of you with kids, get your kids' smartphones and throw them out and buy them copies of real music and, and rock and roll music and... Uh, give them these compilations and say, here you go. Here's Spotify for you. Here's my Spotify, hmm. these albums. So you would think that one was the end of it, but you would be wrong. And there was one more that came out kind of as an Internet-only release, an iTunes release, called Tomorrow Never Knows. Oh, yeah. That was 2012, and it was kind of like they were trying to make up for rock and roll music in a way, you know, it has revolution paperback writer and your bird can sing helter skelter Savoy truffle. I'm down the let it be naked version of I've got a feeling back in the USSR. You can't do that. It's all too much. She said, she said, Hey, bulldog. Tomorrow Never Knows, and the Anthology 3 version of The End. So it's not hits necessarily, although Paperback Writer is there. Uh, it's not rarities. It's kind of, it's kind of like a slightly odder rock tracks. You know, She Said, She Said, Tomorrow Never Knows. It's like these are the sort of pushing the edge mm -hmm. tracks in a way. Uh, you know, but in a rock, rockier context, they did issue a press album. You know, it, it, 
an LP uh, yeah. that they sent to press, which I'm looking at right now. Um, you and have one? I do. It's a collectible I would like to track down one day, but it's pretty expensive and pretty rare as well. And all it really is is I think that's what you were just about going to say. There's really nothing to it packaging-wise. Yeah, the packaging is just like, uh, you know, the the cover is white. It has the Beatles in big orange letters. It has uh, a picture of what would be the LP label if it was a bootleg. You know, it just says Tomorrow Never Knows 1 and Tomorrow Never Knows 2 on the other side. The back has the track listing and an Apple logo and all the rights information. But the, the label on the record is the same as that picture, just... Tomorrow Never Knows, one and two. It's nice thick vinyl. And, you know, it's a nice little thing to have. But it's also, it's not only does it look like a boot, but I think it's definitely inspired by one because in the bottom right corner, it says file under colon rock. And while the early Capitol records all, all used to say file under Beatles or whatever, this looks like it's rubber stamped on and it reminds me of the old bootleg file under so i yeah. I, I, ah. I i wonder if you know whoever put this together had that in mind i kind of think so oh wow so what do you guys think of it as a compilation though i like I the idea of it yeah i think it was terrific i mean that sort of sort of like reads off like a mixtape would would yeah. something that we might put together for ourselves Right, and the type of compilation that wasn't going to come out in the '70s, when yeah. they all seem to be more geared towards known tracks and hits and whatnot. This was deep album cuts and even some songs that some folks might consider obscurities. Yeah, you know, it's all too much and Savoy Truffle. Yeah. Actually, George yeah. is uh, pretty well yeah. represented here, I guess. So, well, only they two. also did a, a digital album putting the uh, full-length unreleased tracks that were on the three anthology albums out as well. Did they? Mm. Uh, I, I don't know what it was called, though, but you talking about Tomorrow Never Knows reminded me that they had also done something digitally where they kind of got the cream of the crop off the three anthology albums and put them out as one digital album. Hmm. You're right. I remember that. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions that we should deal with. One is, in these days of streaming, is there any point to compilations anymore when you can go on to Spotify and make your own compilation? I would say absolutely yes, still. And the proof is in the pudding if you look at the Billboard charts, because the Billboard charts reflect what people buy. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the top 200, you'll find lots of compilations and greatest hits albums still. And... Kind of like what I said with the Beatles, whenever any uh, veteran act puts out a new album, it usually means that if, uh, if there's attention being given to that artist, then a Greatest Hits album will bounce back on the charts along with it. Mm -hmm. And it happens all the time. If you look at the top 200 right now, you'll find Journey, Tom Petty, Bob Seger, the Eagles. So evidently, you know, there are people out there that want ready-made compilations where the songs are chosen for them, you mm -hmm. know, and it's still it still is something that's important. And I think the Billboard charts, you know, uh, are proof of that. Okay. If people didn't want it, they wouldn't be on the charts. And, um, you know, like I said, whether it's the Beatles or any other act, a good way to introduce yourself to any artist is by having them listen to a greatest hits or some kind of a compilation that spans their entire careers. Okay. That makes sense. And I guess if you are trying to figure out what it is about the Beatles that everybody likes and you don't know their stuff, you don't really know enough to make your own Spotify list. Mm, that's true. Yep. So to play devil's advocate though, okay. as much as I do agree with you, Ken, and I want to agree 100% with you, you know, because I'm old school with the albums and the Spotify and, you know, physical formats versus streaming. I'm not sure if the compilation album hold, it holds some weight, but I don't think it holds the weight it used to. And because there are Spotify playlists that are made that people can subscribe to that are like or download or whatever uh, that are like 
mixtapes or like a label's best of or band's best of album. I want to believe that the, the compilation album still, uh, you know, has some clout. I just I'm not sure it does. Yeah. I think it still does. I don't think it's as much as it once did, but it's still there. I mean, how can you ignore the charts? The charts reflect sales. So that's telling you that people are still buying this the way that it's packaged this way. Right. Whether right. it's physical, whether it's digital. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. See, I guess I guess part of my um attitude towards compilations, you know, when I say that what's the point, who cares, is like this. There are some groups where I like a bunch of their songs, but I really don't care to hear the album cuts in between because, you know, maybe I've heard an album or two and it isn't very much apart from the things that were hits. And so for that, I would get a compilation. You know, I get a compilation of Paul Revere and the Raiders' greatest hits uh, rather than feel that I need to have their entire discography. Now, I I should actually parenthetically add that I do have their entire discography, but I don't listen to those records very much. If I want to hear Paul Revere and the Raiders, I'm very likely to put on a compilation because that's the stuff I like most. But I don't think of the Beatles as that kind of group. To me, you have to know it all. You have to hear it all. It's all great. There are no real dogs in the entire discography. So Mm -hmm. that's probably why I feel that way about the Beatles and even, you know, in the solo Beatles, you know, a compilation was, well, that's, you know, come on, come on, just get all the albums, (laughs) you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think compilations should serve as a starting point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the Beatles catalog, which I feel all the songs go from good to great, to buy the Beatles one and stop at that is a crime. <laughs> right. Yeah. You'll never get the full taste of their whole catalog that way. There'll always be people who think that the hits of an artist are the greatest songs with the Beatles. You could say that in some cases, but there's plenty of album tracks that are among their greatest songs. Mm-hmm. So the only way that you can ever get the full taste, the full flavor, really appreciate everything the Beatles did is by listening to all of it. And, um, you know, if compilations lead new fans to the rest of their catalog, then I'm all for it. Well, we could all debate what selections or, or how we feel about the selections on each compilation. And compilations don't have to be hits, as we've discussed already. Right. They could have a, a theme. They could be like Tomorrow Never Knows, the edgier side, experimental side of the Beatles. That's fine, too. Whatever works for you. If it leads to the rest of the catalog, then I'm a thousand percent for it. Yeah. I um we we did mention this in passing, but we should probably acknowledge Past Masters as a as as a compilation too in a way. Sure. It's like, you know, all the yeah. singles and and that to me is like, you know, I I'd, I'd rather have that than one because that's got them all. It's got both sides. So, well, to a lot of people the hits are mainly the A sides, but some of the Beatles singles the B side was a hit too or it was a double A side. Mm-hmm. So um yeah, but that also best illustrates the fact that the Beatles considered their singles and albums separate entities. So Past Masters Collections really serves that purpose. Right. Because they didn't want to put these these songs on their albums. They didn't want people to buy the song twice. Right. So they live on their own as singles or on EPs. And that's how they looked at the catalog. So in a way, we're kind of looking at it the way they would. Yeah. So for me, the best compilation of the Beatles is the 2009 box of all the remasters. <laughs> so, uh, which is, I guess, the next question we should ask, which is, what about you two? If you had to pick one compilation, what would it be? Darren? Well, I, you know what? I would go with my heart, and I would go back to the American Hey Jude album uh, okay. from 70, uh, because of what it meant to me. Mm-hmm. personally coming out just before i turned five and and getting the album right around the time of its release and probably thus the first beatle album my own or definitely was the first beatle album that i completely devoured uh until my dad brought home abby road and let it be uh which i'm assuming was after i already had hey jude i could be wrong but going you know in chronological order by release I know that he got those Abbey Road and Let It Be simultaneously 
because he brought them home at the same time and they kind of got played together in our house. Let It Be came out after Hey Jude, so I can only assume that I probably had Hey Jude first and that was the one that really broke the, you know, threw the doors open for me and uh, was my first big dose of Beatles music. So I'll, I'll take that, and it makes it easier that it did come out on CD. I'm assuming it's still in print, the CD version of Hey Jude. There uh, is? That came out just a few years back. Wait. Uh, so that's my pick. Oh, that. On the American Albums box, totally forgot about that. Huh. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And they were released. To, now, look at C. I don't. Rem- I remember what I was doing when I was five and not when I was... Uh, 50, uh, I'm assuming, <laughs> yeah, all those albums, right, yeah, they were available also individually and in that, right, bo- in the, right, right, oh, the Capitals box, right, okay, I need a nap now, Ken, uh, your t- Ken, well, I have to combine the red and the blue, mm-hmm. I can't pick one and not the other, mm-hmm. because I think it's a, it's a great compilation that not only has the hits, but does have album cuts, so it has among the most essential of all the Beatles songs and those two compilations. And it's kind of impossible. If you're talking about hits, even though one is a tremendous compilation and you certainly get your money's worth on one disc with the Beatles one, you know, that's only the number one hits. You don't have the top 10 hits that didn't make number one or even lesser hits. So it's not really complete when it comes to hits. And then on top of that, you also have to deal with the fact that when it comes to hits, certain songs were hits in, different countries <laughs> that may not be hits here and vice versa i mean we had twist and shout as a hit here we had do you want to know a secret uh, as a as a hit here and yet they're not on the red album hmm. you know so nothing is complete truly complete uh in these compilations although the beatles won for number one singles us uk it is but i like the fact that they they add the album tracks too and um it's certainly not a perfect compilation, because like I said, I really think that Revolver is not represented well, nor is the White Album, for that matter, because mm-hmm. you only have, I think, three songs in the White Album, right. considering the fact that it's a double album that really wasn't treated fairly. But um, I, I think overall, the red and the blue, because of when it came out, how important I think that affected radio, especially rock radio, and it really outlined some of the important album tracks from the Beatles, along with the hits. I think you really can't beat those two as a package. Okay, so you're getting onto the boat to head out towards the desert island, and I'm standing there with my clipboard, and I say, "Uh, excuse me, Mr. Michaels, I see you have two compilations there. You have to choose one. What do you do? Well, mine are glued together, so you really... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay now, i i guess i'd pick the blue one yeah yeah so my choice really apart from the 2009 box of course would be the red and the blue and i would pick the blue one too so wow banner day we agree on almost <laughs> everything today <laughs> so it can happen it can happen All right. So um, this was a lot of fun. I mean, much more fun than I would have expected talking about compilations, apart from the, you know, the the history of them is interesting. And there are those odd tracks here and there with different mixes that you got to have. So yeah, I enjoy that. Uh, Thanks, guys. And I think we should give our contact information. And let's start with Darren. All right. Well, you could uh, go to Facebook. And uh, look up my radio page and click like. And that is uh, the page being Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. It's a long name, I know. But uh, you might find my personal page, just Darren DeVivo. I would prefer if you'd go over to the radio page. And anyway, I put more interesting stuff on the radio page anyway. At least I try to. So that's Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. If you want to email me directly, my name, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. And if I could just quickly throw in the hours that I'm on the air, Monday through Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. Uh, till 2 in the morning on WFUV and also on our alternate or alternative channel, not alternative music, 
But uh, an option, an alternate to the main WFUV is what uh, I refer to as FUV music. Saturday afternoons at noon till midnight Sunday nights, I'm playing the FUV music mix on uh, online, on our app, and on our HD2 channel only when you're talking about radio dials, 90.7 FM HD2 for the weekends. Okay, and Ken? My email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget that I do have my Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. I do want to mention that uh, a new prize that I have to give away is the brand new CD from The Weaklings. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with the group, this is a band that uh, has put out two albums before this. It's made up primarily of original songs done in the style of early Beatles. And they've also covered rare Beatles songs that the Beatles gave away to other artists on those two albums. Their brand new album, which is called Three, which was partly recorded, by the way, at Abbey Road Studios, um, has mainly original songs, but like I said, very Beatles songs. And they also cover Baby, You're a Rich Man on the album and the rock classic Friday on My Mind with mm. Peter Noon mm. of Herman's Hermit's fame doing uh, the lead vocals on it. So you can win that as well as Peter Asher's new book, The Beatles Who Made a Z, Ken Womack's new book on the Abbey Road album, Solid State. And I also want to mention that I was just a guest on the Beatles podcast called Tomorrow Never Knows. I talk about my long history doing Beatles radio programs and uh, discuss anything and everything about the Beatles. You can find that show on YouTube. Just look up Tomorrow Never Knows podcast. And uh, I'm on there. And uh, since I was recorded, Kid O'Toole, my fellow co-host on Talk More Talk, just did a show. On Tomorrow Never Knows. If you follow that podcast, you got two shows with uh, two of the co-hosts for Talk More Talk on there. Speaking of which, that show is on every other Monday night on uh, our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. It is a live broadcast. You can add comments as we're doing our show. We just did a program on George's Gone Tropo album and how we feel about it all these years later. And uh, that show can be found on YouTube as well, iTunes, the same place as you can find this show. And so, uh, yeah, be sure to check out all of that and um, my website. Like I said, KenMichaelsRadio.com. I think that covers everything. Okay. I like Gontrapo. I think it's very underrated. You should have been on the show. Yeah, well... Anyway, uh, you can <laughs> you can contact me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, Alan Cozen tends to be more of my classical stuff, and Remix tends to be more of my Beatles stuff. But either way, we have a Facebook page called Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, and you can contact us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's all one word things we said today radio show and the other the facebook page things we said today beatles radio fans i think steve marinucci set these up and he had this penchant for weirdly lengthy germanic type names you know some millions of words um but we do have a very short name for our Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab. So that does it for this time. And thank you so much for listening. And for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying good night, good luck, and see you next time. Mm-hmm.